Oh, welcome back, Hoop District Podcast. Joe Glorioso, Abdullah Sharif, and Jamal Smith. We are here with one of our favorite Wizards players of all time. And yes, we do say all time. Marcin Gortat, he is on the call with us. Marcin, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Doing fantastic, sir. Doing fantastic. So let's get let's get right into this. So me, Potatoes, you're a busy guy. I know you're out in L.A. right now, so let's not take up any more of your time. Uh, March, you played soccer and track and field as a kid. Your dad was an Olympic medalist in boxing. Your mom was a Polish national volleyball team member. Where did basketball come into play for you? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to say because um, I've been playing soccer since I was 10 years old and somewhere around 17, 18, when I was 17, 18 years old, I decided to change sport discipline. Basically, I was in, in one club and I just changed the discipline from soccer into basketball. Uh, and the person who actually convinced me was my uh, uh, was a teacher from my school that he was teaching a sports education, uh, and and he was telling me that you're not going to be a soccer goalie because back then I was a goalie, you're not going to be goalie, you got to go into basketball, you're going to have a bigger future in basketball. And uh, yeah, after you know a few months of uh, talking to him, he finally convinced me, and uh, I changed sports, and uh, yeah, I don't regret it at all. <laughs> you 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 had to be. Uh, how tall were you when you were growing up playing soccer? You, you must have been. Well, solid. I was always tall. I was always, I was always tall. I think they were when I was, you know, somewhere around 16, 17 years old. There was a, there was a time when I really went up. I grew probably a few inches, and I was really tall. Okay. Every time when I was going to school, you know, everybody would tell me like, "Oh, you must be at least, you know." Uh, 20 years old and back then I was you know 15 16 years old and the guys were looking at me like what the hell guy like what what are you eating every day like what's your mom feeding you with you know and basically I was always tall but uh, you know from the, the day when I changed basketball I mean soccer to basketball obviously everything changed for me I, I started feeling more comfortable with my height I started feeling more comfortable with everything I was doing and it was definitely uh it was a great ride for me definitely so that you you know you said that you got talked into basketball did you have a favorite player and team when you were growing up well later on when i started watching basketball more and more uh obviously i fell in love you know with, with the game of basketball and i started following guys like shaquille kevin garnett and you know and later on you know guys like jermaine o'neal and, and I, I was watching these guys all the time and and i remember that you know when i play in uh german league in bundesliga um you know, my coach was always yelling at me, like, why are you always so tired in the morning? I was like, coach, I was watching NBA be a game at three o'clock in the morning. He's like, Jesus Christ. I'm like, listen, you know, at, at least he was happy that I was watching NBA be a game that not that I was in the club, you know, partying with the other guys. But, you know, he was like, all right, you know, I can live with a basketball game in the morning, but, you know, not with a club. So uh, that's how it was with with me. You know, I was always watching, you know, NBA games and, uh, you know, eventually I, I made my dream. You know, I made it to the NBA. Hey, Mars, speaking of, um, you, you talked about your, your, your roots and your starts in the league, obviously overseas. Um, can you talk about how the NBA and the globalization of the game has changed from the time that you kind of first picked up a ball to where it is now? What do, what do you think about the global influence of the game? Well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's tremendous. You know, the NBA has a tremendous impact on young kids. I mean, that logo we, we, we carry on the chest, from the middle of the chest, you know, Jerry West logo, it's, it's so powerful. I mean, it's so powerful to the point where if you have a scout, you have an assistant coach, you have a, someone that is, you know, that is coming from the NBA team or is, or is attached to the NBA team and is carrying that logo, he's like a god in all different countries and, you know, in all, all different countries like in Europe or Africa. People looking at those people like, like they are heroes, like they are God because they are, you know, NBA players, NBA, you know, officials or NBA, you know, people from, you know, uh, management and stuff like that. So, you know, NBA was, is doing a tremendous job. They're going worldwide, you know, dramatically. I, I mean, they, they are all over the place. And uh, at this point right now, I got to tell you, Poland, I mean, I don't think there's anybody in Poland that doesn't know the NBA. I mean, this, this league is so powerful. And I just wish we could have more Polish guys being in the league right now. But, you know, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that talent. Hey, Martin, so to that point about, you know, the globalization of the NBA, the current Wizards roster is pretty much comprised of a bunch of young kids, international guys like Rui Hachimura from Japan. 
You've got Isaac Bonga. Mm-hmm. You've got Mo Wagner from Germany. Are you surprised mm-hmm. the team went the international route or not so much considering what you know about Tommy Shepard and, and his background of, uh, of, of international players? Well, let, let me tell you, I mean, I, I truly believe that every NBA team, every NBA GM is looking for that next, you know, Drajan Petrovic or, you know, Dirk Nowitzki or, you know, Manu Ginobili or Tony Parker, you know, they, you know, Paul Gasol, they all looking for that, you know, superstar coming out of Europe that, that, you know, that the kid who's, you know, kind of, you know, slipping out of, uh, under the radar and nobody talks about him. And all of a sudden those teams are picking up these guys from Europe. And then he's, you know, this, this big superstar, you know, five, 10 years right. later, he's this big superstar. I think every GM is dreaming about a kid like that. And that's why they are willing to take chances on, on those guys. Right. Because at the end of the day, when you're getting guys from Europe, you're not only getting a guy from Europe, you're probably getting additional, you know, 20, 30, 40 million fans from his country because they are following, you know, following him in the NBA. Like, you know, obviously it's different when you have a guy from France, Spain, or Serbia, you know, these guys have, you know, 10, 15 guys from, from their country. But for me, for example, I was the only one from my country. I was the third, the third and uh, Polish player for coming out of my country and, and, and the player who survived an NBA. So, Basically, I had, you know, 38 million, 38 million people following me, right. additional 20 million in, in 20 million people in state, you know, right. uh, following me. So, it, it, you know, you're not only talking about exposure, you're also talking about selling tickets, setting, selling merchandise, jerseys, you know, and 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 I think it's great, you know, uh, bringing every every I mean, bringing all the guys from different countries, different continents, you're also bringing different culture to the team, you know. I mean, exactly. how many guys you have in NBA that when you right. go to the locker room, you talk to the guys and say, hey, man, have you ever been in Poland? He said, dude, I never left my city, you know, <laughs> right. in my life. And right. I'm, like, I'm like, are you serious, man? Like, you know, you're talking to the guys. Some guys never left the city. Some guys never left the state. Some guys never left the country, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I I'm don't sure a lot of Porter loves you for that. <laughs> <laughs> right and exactly well I, I didn't want to mention names but when you already pop one then i'm going to say it you know i don't <laughs> was the, one of the guys that never left his country you know and right. i talked to him i said i don't come to poland you know visit yeah. visit my country let's let's see the kids you know from poland and you know i'm going to introduce you know to the polish women and you know that the polish culture the polish food <laughs> and i said dude, I said dude no problem but i gotta i gotta i gotta get my passport and i was like what the hell you say you don't have a passport and he's like no i don't so you know it was like it was a whole freaking process you know to get out of, out of the country you know but you know finally when he did it i mean i mean yeah, Lord, blast. he was blessed right. i mean he was blessed i mean i really show him and I was insisting, you know, because obviously having young guys coming out of out of NBA, going to a different countries, you know, most of the thing, mo- mo- most of the time, they the only thing they see is basketball court, and they practice with the little kids, and they see nightclub because that's what they want to do. But I told Otto, no, man, I'm going to show you different things. And I took him to one museum, you know, I took him to a uh, Holocaust camp where Germans were, you know, killing um, uh, Jewish people, and and it was. It was a life, life-changing life experience for Otto. You know, he really understood a lot when he visited, you know, museum, he visited that camp, and he came com- he came back to States completely as a different person, you know, because he learned so much about the history. He learned so much about my country and about my culture that, you know, at the end of the day, I was really happy that I was able to give him so many information. Yeah, so, submarine, too. Yeah, that's right. The submarine, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, there we had we got many Marines, you know, we got many troops, soldiers coming over from Poland uh, to the United States. And, you know, I, one thing I learned from American culture, I was always watching over, you know, all the NBA teams, helping out the military uh, personnel and, you know, doing all the events and all the charity work for the military. And I got to tell you, when, when my when, when my troops and my soldiers came from Poland and I put them on the middle of the floor and 20,000 people stood up and started clapping, cheering for them, giving them standing ovation. These guys cried. I mean, these guys cried. And, and, you know, before they came into the United States, they were acting like they tough and, you know, like they all, you know, got and everything. I said, listen, man, I'm telling you, they're going to cry. I said, I mean, you're going to have a tears in your eyes when you're going to stand on the court and 20,000 American people is going to stand up and cheer for you. And at, at that point, it doesn't matter. You're a Polish soldier or, you know, or whatever, Iraqi soldier, you are basically soldier and you fight for freedom and people will, you know, people will appreciate that. So 
you know, it was a it was a huge huge experience for my for my troops, and and I definitely appreciate to you know Tommy and the Washington Wizards and and NBA for allowing me to do that. You know, that's definitely big. You know, we and we were firsthand witness to the things that you did with the Polish embassy and the kids that you hosted here in D.C. Uh, it, it's what it's kind of what made you such a, a a fan favorite over here in March. And to be honest with you, it's it, it's it's really easy to cover what you do on the court. But it's the stuff off the right. court is the stuff that we love to cover and we like to broadcast it because right. you guys are more than just athletes. You guys are you have right. these platforms. Well, obviously. Right, but you know, in order for, in order for you guys to know that, like you gotta show up at the practice, you yeah, gotta show right. up before the game, you gotta show up after the game, you gotta talk to us, you know, and that's nice. I mean, you did, you guys basically did your homework, you know. I mean, obviously, I wasn't there for five months; I was there for five years, so right. we knew we knew exactly, you know. Well, you guys knew exactly what I was doing. It wasn't just one time thing; it was, you know, annually every year I was doing the same thing and. And I ain't gonna lie, you know. Thanks to thanks to Washington, thanks to you know great great management like Ernie and Tommy because they helped me, they helped me a lot. They helped me a lot. They they allow me to do a lot of things. They help me with tickets. They help me with uh, facility. They they provide the facility for me. They you know they gave me different contacts you know in the city to show them the museums and 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 different you know different. Uh, um, you know, culture things like monuments and the White House and stuff like that. So, you know, if 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 I won't have that support from the management from the team, I mean, it would be impossible. But those kids, like I said, I've seen NBA game when I was 21 years old. I mean, I made it to the NBA when I was uh, I, I made it 21. Actually, I made it as a 23 years old. I was drafted as a 20 or 21 years old. Right. So at age 23, I've seen my first NBA game. But then next thing you know, you have those kids, you know, 10 years old kids from Poland. They are sitting front court watching NBA game. I'm like, what the hell? You know, I mean, I'm, right. I, 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 I'm glad I had this opportunity. And, you know, obviously, thanks to the Washington Wizards, I had this opportunity to show these kids, you know, how the NBA game looks like. So you mentioned you mentioned Tommy and, and, and Ernie and the front office. And there's a lot of Wizards fans right. who really don't. You know, they think that just because Tommy is still here, that there's going to be status quo on what happened before. And, you know, it's just going to be the same thing happening over and over again. Could you kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and maybe tell some people some things about Tommy that, that you as a player can appreciate? He seems to be so much more in tune with today's players than possibly Ernie was. Could you kind of peel back the right. onion a little bit there and, and maybe share it with some well, people? Well, let's let's be honest. And I spoke with Ernie about this. I spoke with Tommy about this. So I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm feeling like I have a green light to say this. Well, Ernie was a old school GM. I would say I will use this term with, in a respectful way. He was a old dinosaur, you know. He was a old old T Rex sitting behind the desk and trying to figure out how to build a team. And and at the end of the day, he did he did decent job because he drafted. He drafted, you know, pretty good players. He picked it up, you know, great players, uh, and and he did decent job. But I would say Tommy was the guy who was actually doing more more work behind the closed doors because he had a great relationship with each player. He was always very very positive. He was always wow. very positive. I mean, after worst game in the NBA uh, season or playoffs or the worst performance, he will come to you and say, "Hey, listen." I believe in you. I know you're a great player. I know you have a potential. You know, you know the right. the do do happen, do do happen, whatever. Don't worry about it. You know, listen. Tomorrow is the next day. Come back tomorrow. Regroup. You know, you know, uh, uh, refresh your mind and come back tomorrow stronger. And and I always had you know tons of respect for Tommy. Uh, one thing is sure: when Tommy was pissed, he will let you know. And <laughs> bottom line is, he when he was pissed, when he was pissed. I felt, I'm, I'm specifically talking about myself because there was, you know, two or three times there was a situation where he was pissed at me. And, and I really felt bad. I really felt bad at that time that I really disappointed my, my, you know, GM or the president, whatever position he had back then. I was really disappointed that I, I let him down, mm -hmm. you know, for all the help he had, for all the positive yeah. energy he brought to, you know, brought to me. I always felt like, you know, Oh my God, I screw up. Like I felt <laughs> bad, you know, and that was always motivating me to go back on the court. I, I was thinking at home, like, what can I do? What can I do to, you know, to, to, to apologize? What can I do to make him feel better? Or, or, you know, what can I do to, you know, 
so so he ain't gonna be so pissed. You know, my first idea was like, okay, I'm gonna bring a bottle of cognac or a bottle of Hennessy, and we'll, give it to him, we'll be and, and we'll be fine. But obviously, I'm that, sure that, that helped. wasn't the case. That wasn't right. That would help, but it wasn't the case. And we all knew, you know, we all knew. Listen, the right. best the, the best way to apologize is just go on the court and right. just you know leave your heart on the court, and that's what I try to do. And, you know, I, I had a great relationship with Tommy. I got a great relationship till now. I mean, you know, the day when he traded, when they got, when the guys trade, when they, when they traded me, he called me and said, listen, man, I love you. Uh, you know, I said, I love him too. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's what has to be done. And, and we move on, you know, we still friend, we, we, st- we friends still till now. And, uh, you know, I asked for a trade and, you know, my, my favorite destination was, uh, you know, West Coast, probably L.A. And he said, listen, we, you know, we respect you. We respect your decision and we made your wish. You know, we traded you to the Clippers. So it was it was definitely uh, it was definitely great. Great option for me. March, you talked about um, Ernie's draft picks right in that era. Um, and, he, you know, he did make some, you know, some great picks. We have uh, obviously. John and Brad, and uh, when we look at those guys, obviously we have a, a little bit of a different look to the team to start this season, but provided those right. guys are fully healthy, do you think they can anchor a, a championship contender? Right. Well, at this point, I mean, obviously, uh, I would say the, you know, picking up the right guys, it's, it's the one thing. You know, guys like John, Brad, uh, Otto, then, uh, uh, you know, Kelly Oubre, you know, those guys, I mean, they pick really good guys. Uh, and then at the end of the day, picking the guys is only one thing, but the rest of the success is, you know, signing the right guys, managing the guys and everything, you know, and, and many other things is involved in the whole process of building uh, a championship team. Uh, can I judge them and say they did some, they screw up something? I mean, I don't know. I've never been in that position. I don't know what's going on behind the closed doors. So, I can't really, you know, throw them under the bus right now and say, hey, they made a mistake with this, this, or this. I can't, you know. They made a decision that, that felt is going to be the best for the team. Uh, are guys like, you know, John, Brad, and Otto, and probably Kelly are the good team to, to, to build around them to build the championship team? Yeah, they are. But at the same time, you can have four guys. You can make four guys happy. I mean, Jesus Christ, that, that you will need <laughs> at least – two or maybe three basketballs on the court at the same time to make all these guys happy. And the worst thing is that these guys pretty much playing at the same position. So it wasn't that easy. Uh, one, two, uh, obviously John and Brad is right now left in the team and, and uh, obviously John is injured, but they can still build, build the team around these guys and, and, and they can build a team to, to compete for the championship. I mean, these guys are not rookies anymore. They pay, they pay their deuces already. They, they've been in the league for a while uh, they they don't have to prove anything. Uh, Brand is uh, John is a great leader. Uh, Brad is a great leader. Uh, you know they both need each other to win. I think you just have to put the right pieces around the team, and and they should be uh, still contender for for winning championship. Uh, Marchin, so we know you've had some good relationships while you're here with the team. Obviously, we talked about Otto. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know you were pretty close with Tom, Tomas Sadaransky and uh, Kelly right. Oubre. You mentioned. Do you still keep in touch with any of those guys? Do you guys have do you have a relationship ongoing with them? Still? Oh yeah, I'm talking to I'm talking to uh, Otto and I'm talking to uh, Thomas Sadaransky pretty much you know what once every two three weeks or once a month we sending messages you know we we talking through uh, Instagram uh, we basically following on you know checking on each other what we do and uh, and you know I'm cheering for them I'm I'm happy for them you know they they move they move. Uh, moved to the different situation right now specifically thomas uh it was obvious guys i mean there's not a secret you ain't gonna play over john wall i mean right. i don't care how good you are you ain't gonna right. play over john wall so we <laughs> all knew it, it was a question of time when the guy has to you know when the guy's gonna get an offer from a different team or he's gonna be traded i mean it was obvious right. and you know he went to the team where he can play he went to the team where he's going to be a starter and, and, and hopefully he's going to be a starter because I had to, actually don't even know if he's starting right now, but uh, you know, I'm happy for him that he's in the team where he's going to be able to show what he can do. He, he signed a nice contract and right. uh, you know, life is beautiful. He became a father recently. Uh, you know, I mean, life is beautiful for him. Uh, I'm keeping in touch, trying to stay in touch with some guys from Washington from the from the medical staff from uh, right. from the weight room with a strength conditional coach, I'm keeping in touch with with most of the guys. 
So so in 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 DC, uh, Wizards fans will forever have what we call Gilbert Fever. And I know you were on the same <laughs> roster as Gilbert Arenas for about 25, 30 games in Orlando your last year there before you got traded to Phoenix. Uh, do you have any notable memory of your time with Gilbert Arenas? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to kill you. I don't want to kill your scouting because uh, <laughs> when Gilbert was when Gilbert was when Gilbert was traded from Washington to uh, Orlando, there were two trades at the same time. From Orlando, I went to the Phoenix the same day he was traded from Washington to Orlando. That's so right. I never had a chance to play with him. You never but, crossed paths in the airport, not, at least. <laughs> well, I crossed with him at YMCA, to be honest with you. I, <laughs> and I was about to, you know, I, I was about I, because what I heard is, you know, his knees were busted. You know, he didn't move well. I was like, that's my chance to, you know, to beat, you know, Agent Zero. I said, this is my chance right now. But the guy was dribbling the ball, and it, you know the handle was looking good. I was like, okay, maybe that's not the right time, you know. <laughs> so he was he was working out. He was working out in the, at the YMCA in Orlando. I think back then, I think he was getting ready to move to China. Uh, I, I think he was already gone from Orlando, and he was moving to uh, to to China. And there was I've seen him only one time at the gym, but I never had an opportunity to play with him. Uh. Marchant, what do you what do you miss most about DC? You were here for five years. You had a good chance to see a lot of the museums and nightclubs and bars and food. I did, I did, and uh, that's a great question. You know, I I was really thinking about that before a few hours ago, and I gotta tell you, I miss everything. I miss everything, including the damn potholes you guys have on the streets. And uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I busted, I busted through five in five years. I busted at least five rims and three tires. So uh, you know, I, I whatever. I, I I call this you know living in DC, but. You know, I miss I miss that beautiful weather, you know, the cold weather when you got, you know, half an inch of snow and the city is completely paralyzed. They're shutting everything down, including 24-hour McDonald's. You know, I, I miss everything about Washington. I swear to God. I mean, I miss the team. I miss the guys. Uh, I, I really, I really, I really can call Washington my home. You know, it's funny because I, I put logos in my, in my garage in Orlando, in my garage in Washington. I put a, a Washington Wizards logo, and I said, my friends told me like, what you gonna do now when you, when you get traded and and you, you don't play for the team anymore? I said, you know what? I'm gonna keep it because I was a wizard, you know, for five years. I felt like, I felt like there was a wizard blood in my, in my veins, and I don't want to move that. So. You know, I feel I feel I feel really good in Washington. Obviously, you know, last year was kind of rocky. You know, you know, relationship between me and a few guys in the team was, you know, rocky. But at the end of the day, we still friends. You know, uh, later when I came back with the Clippers team to the Washington, I talked to all the guys. I talked to Brad. I talked to John on the court. We laugh. We joke. We hug each other because. You know what? At the end of the day, we fought for five years in, in many battles. You know, we had many wars and many battles, and and some of them we won, some of them we lost. But at, at the end of the day, there is no bad blood. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I know that as a veteran, I know as a veteran, I did, I did, I I, I had a poor judgment uh, in certain situation in in my five years uh, stunt in Washington. I should probably say or do different things as as a veteran in this team. I can't really judge the young players because. They have to be in the league for a while to understand what's going on and why you have to act a certain way. But I already knew back then, and I haven't done that. Uh, also, I would say, you know, I, I I I wish I could, you know, change a few things back then when I was when I was in Washington in Washington. But now, I mean, it's too late. You can't really do anything now. Uh, I know Tommy's doing great job. Uh, I was always Tommy's fan, and matter of fact, I was pushing, I was calling people, and I was posting on Twitter and on on, on Instagram that Tommy should be you know, the next GM, because after all these years being in Washington, he knows the management, he knows the players, he should get his shot being GM. And, uh, you know, I, I, I truly believe he's going to do a good job. You know, at least he's going to get a chance. And, and I'm really happy for, for, for Tommy. That's great. So, Mars, we'll, we'll bring it home on this. Um, what is your, uh, what do you think the league's perception of the Wizards is right now? As we go into this 2019, 2020 season, how do you think the Wizards are viewed around the league? Oh, how they are viewed. Well, they they probably obviously uh, everything starts from John and Brad. You know, they view them as a people as a as a teammate. Probably they don't like each other, which is not necessarily true. I mean, uh, you know, 
they hang out together, they talk to each other, they post pictures together. I mean, I, I truly believe that after all these years, it's impossible that they don't like each other that much. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, they've been for so many years together. They, you got to like that person, you know, that you're playing <laughs> next to. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's not a point. I mean, you always, you, you got to look at the team from the, you know, from the results standpoint. You know, if you're winning, having, you know, one, two, three great players in the team, and you're winning, you know, 38, you know, 40 games, and you're not even 500, then, yeah, something wrong with y'all. You know what I'm saying? But uh, we'll see. I mean, listen, it's all about results. You know, these guys are going to come out. They got to start the season strong. I mean, obviously, they're going to play without John, but they got to start the season well. They have few cats in the team that, you know, they can perform. Uh, they're going to have probably green light because, obviously, besides Brad, you know, who's going to take now, he's going to probably take 30 shots a game. You're going to have a lot of, a lot. <laughs> and I know Brad is probably happy about it, but at the same time, I know he's, no, listen, that's what he's supposed to do. I mean, of course, he's, yeah. he's, of he's, course. he's, he's a, uh, you know, walking bucket, AKA, yeah. AKA walking bucket, you know, oh, I'm, like I'm, I'm still laughing that, and guess what? He can take 30 shots. He's going to get you 30. But I know if I said, you know, at least 20 screens, he's going to score. He's going to go for 40 because he's definitely missing me. But, you know, at the end of the day, at the, I'm always going to joke about that. But listen, I, I, I take, you know, I take I take a lot of uh, respect what I do and on, uh, what I was doing on the court. And, and, you know, John and Brad was making me better. But at the same time, I was making better. I was making them better. So. Hey man, you had you uh, had you, know, you led you led the league in screen assists one year, so no one can argue that. Yeah, for like for like three years, guys. Hold hey, on. there you Let's go. Three years. For like three I, years straight, I, right? Didn't mean to shortchange you. you. <laughs> <laughs> right, things never change, right? So, uh, like I said, Brad obviously is gonna take you know, and that's what he got to do because he's a he's a pure scorer. So he's gonna take between twenty to thirty shots, and and he's gonna lead the team. But there's gonna be a lot of guys that's going to have a green light and, and, you know, there's going to be a time for them to shy, you know, they're going to get their opportunity. They're going to, they're going to have a chance to perform. And, and then hopefully when John's going to come back, they're going to, you know, they're going to make a run and hopefully they're going to make playoffs. That's great. That's great. All right, Martin, we're going to get you out of here on this. we got two segments that we finished with our guests. The first one is what comes to mind. So it's going to be the first thing that comes to mind when we say, and then we'll let you know. All right. So this all is going right. to be a quick fire. So the first one, what comes to mind? Five guys burgers. Oh, Jason Williams. <laughs> Jason Williams. 12, all right. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I was on a road and Jason Williams said, have you ever tried five guys? I said, what? Five guys? Like, what are you talking about? I, I completely had no idea what he was talking to me. And he said, well, let me show you. So he took me to this burger spot, right? We ate a burger. I was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. So for the next <laughs> month, he because he owned like five or ten of them, he brought me the gift cards with like $100, uh, you know, on it. And so you can go to any five guy and you're going to get burgers for free. So that's how he hooked me on five guys. And matter of fact, I ate last night at uh, five guys. That was great. <laughs> Holy shit. That is fantastic. Okay, March. The next one is Randy Whitman. Oh, Lord. Yelling, 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 Randy yelling, yelling but uh, you know what? I have plenty of love for Randy. I mean, he yelled at me like I was 18 years old basketball player, and I wasn't back then, but <laughs> I love Randy. I mean, whatever Randy is right now, I hope, Randy, you can hear me, man. I love you, man. You, you gave me 35 minutes on the court, sometimes even 45 minutes. <laughs> and and I was just running like a kid every time when I was getting so many minutes from you. And Randy was the guy who was, you know, running places for me. You know, one thing I feel bad for him. Oh, he was always on the hot seat, man. He was always on the hot seat. And, you know, he was always dealing with this with this whole quotes like, oh, Randy fire, or Randy Whitman should be fired and stuff like that. So it wasn't easy for him. But I'm happy he fixed his hip and the knee. He did the hip surgery and knee surgery. And finally, he's not limping. Yep. All right, next up, uh, WNBA. WNBA. Uh, well, uh, WNBA was the one of the best, of the best uh, women's basketball in the world. I'm excited to say that one of my students, one of my kids from my uh, marching course at basketball camp, is actually uh, really good, and she's probably going to be in WNBA. She's right now in school close to Atlanta. I'm helping her out. I'm, I'm, I'm 
practicing with her, you know, in the off season. And I'm really hoping that she's going to be the first kid that's going to make it to the WNBA from kind of from under, from under my wing. Sweet. Awesome. awesome. Paul Pierce. Woo. Paul Pierce. Uh, I'm definitely not, I know what you expect. You're probably going to say I'm going to call, I call game. Well, no, <laughs> I'm not going to say game. I, I say, I say Paul Pierce, two hours before practice, uh, jump rope, jump rope, jumping for 15 minutes, trying to keep up with me on, on weights, on bench pressing, on cleans, on squats, you know, walking down to the court with me, playing me one-on-one every day at age 36, 37. Jesus Christ, that was incredible, guys. I'm telling you, having having guy like that in the team, having veteran who leads not only by the example, but also with his knowledge and, and skills, Incredible, incredible! One of the best bets I had. Matter of fact, I ran into him. I ran into him in uh, in restaurant in Beverly Hills recently. So yeah, cool guy, great guy. Steve Nash. Oh, Steve Nash, legend. Uh, one, he it was funny. He I, I I told him I told him this one quote before the game. I said, Steve. I said, just look at me. I'm going to bring you to the promised land. And uh, the whole team started cracking and laughing. And they said, just, just, he said, big fella, just get your hands ready. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you can be blind and he's going to make you a top scorer in the league. Bottom line. All right. That's Steve Nash. All right. Last, last one for this segment is Jared Dudley. Jared. Oh. IQ. IQ. Basketball IQ. IQ. Incredible, nice. smart guy. Uh, one of the best teammates I had, if not the best. I would say probably I'll name three, four teammates. Him, Garrett Temple, uh, Thomas Arvinsky, Otto Porter, uh, you know, four teammates that I'll probably say the best teammates I ever play with. Uh, obviously, Steve Nash, too, and Grant Hill and a few other guys, but definitely one of the greatest, the smartest persons I've seen. Super unselfish player. I always love to play with him. He will always give me a, a bucket or two for free uh, in a game. Uh, great person, uh, family guy. I mean, it's it just, I mean, I can just keep going and going, going about the guy. I mean, he was just a tremendous person. Awesome. I'm, I'm happy he's with the Lakers. I'm hope I'm, I'm hoping he's going to make a run to, uh, to NBA finals. Yeah, that'd be good for him. So, Marge, we're going to end it with this segment here. It's called This or That, where I basically okay. – give you two items, two objects, two people, and you tell us really quickly your preference uh, for each one. Okay. All right, we'll start off with John Wall's fast break or Bradley Beal's step back jumper. Oh, ball of deadly. Ball of deadly. All right. Uh, ball of deadly. Well, I say probably – Oh wow! I mean, when John is taking step back, I can at least go for a rebound. When John, <laughs> when John takes off for the fast break, you just stay and wait for him in defense. You let him just come back, because when he takes off, you know, basically he goes all the way to the end. I mean, I don't know. I, I say John Wall. All right. Okay, I don't. All right, uh, Georgetown or Adams Morgan? Say again. Georgetown or Adams Morgan? Take him back home. Take him back to D.C. Ooh, Georgetown or Adams Georgetown. Morgan. Georgetown. Georgetown. All right. Three hundred or three hundred or Gladiator. No, oh, three hundred. I mean, both great movies, but yeah, three hundred. I used to do. Uh, I used to do uh, three hundred uh, training. Ooh, that's intense. Uh, yeah. Schwarzenegger or Stallone. Ah, uh, uh, probably Stallone. I go with Stallone. Okay. Straight from high school to the league, or one and done in college? Well, all depends who you got around you and into what organization you're going to. But I would say probably go to college for one year. Okay. Breaking yeah, go to college one year. Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones? Ooh, Game of Thrones. K 
Calvin Harris or Tiesto? Oh, I love both gentlemen. I've been at Tiesto concert in D.C. twice, not only once. Nice. Uh, I Echo go stage. With, I go with Echo stage, right? I, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Tiesto. Nice. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can't go you can't go wrong with both of these guys. I That's mean, come true. on, That's true. they legends. All right, uh, Shaq or Bill Russell? I gotta go with Shaq. I mean, Shaq is my guy. I mean, I I've, I've been talking to Shaq for a long time. I know him for a while now, and uh, I live next to Shaq in Orlando. Uh, matter of fact, he just I think he's selling that house. So. Whoever wants to buy it, thirty millions get that house, guys. Hey, Rachel Lowe. You're right. On. Right. <laughs> I go with Shaq. No, he's he's definitely. Uh, I, I I probably I would say yeah, Shaq, Shaq. It has to be Shaq, yeah. Another difficult one for you because I know this is gonna hit the the world stage. Drazen or Manu? Well, I'm 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 gonna pick Manu only because uh, from two for two different reasons. One is because my era that's one two because he's the um me and him we are the only two nba players drafted at 57 pick and we only two players that survive in the league longer than one or two years Look at that so i'm gonna pick him the only difference is he got yeah he all the only difference is he got three championships and probably about 100 more millions than me but it's all right you know life is still beautiful <laughs> life is still beautiful you know i got no rings i got less money but it's okay i'm gonna live i'm good Wizards or Bullets? Wizards. I go with Wizards. I was a Wizard. I, I spoke with a few Bullets players, uh, veterans, and, you know, all respect for them. I know that they, they, they had a great run. They had a great team, but I go with the Wizards. I got to be a Wizard for life. All right. Last one, Lover or Fighter? Lover or Fighter? Yeah. Well... I, I think it's time to be a lover. I think it's a, I think it's time to be a lover. I think it's time to be a lover. Back then, when I was young, you know, young and and stupid, I was a fighter. But now it's it's time for being a lover. You're the best, March. Let me just tell you, man. You you're amazing. You you were great to us for five years. You continue to be great to us. Um, hats off to you, man. We miss you. Yeah, All we right, do. Man. We Thank do. We really appreciate that. it, man. You've always been good to Hoop District, man. Hoop District loves Marching Gortat, and we, we hope it's vice versa, man. We really, I love really you guys too, man. I love you guys too. All right, Marching. Thank you so much. No problem, guys. Have a good day, all right? You appreciate too. you, man. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Marching Gortat. What a guy. I, 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 don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to top that interview, man. What a guy. Yeah, that guy was, he's just a wealth of, of, of everything. Uh, so many different like unexpected answers that i just i was kind of just like this thing could probably go on for another like 50 minutes oh it could have yeah Uh, we we scrapped half the segment uh (laughs) because my man had just uh, like backstory upon backstory upon backstory for everything and it's it just it's just a testament to you know what he's been through what he's seen what he's experienced um and just who he is I mean, those, those... YMCA ball with John Wall. Yeah, well, Gil, no, well, Gilbert Arenas. Oh, we get with Gilbert. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Bowser Co- <laughs> love for the Polish military to <laughs> live inside Shaq. I mean, that type of range. Right. I mean, I would, right. Maybe you should give some thought to retiring from, uh, from, from Washington, man. Because we, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think he knows, but obviously we have a different relationship with him than most people do. But uh, he was so, so loved that he was such a fan favorite here. For the guy when he did the hammer, I mean, that was you know that was like electrifying to the crowd. So we definitely did miss him for sure. There was a there was a lot like towards the end of his career here too. There was a lot of like I I, I want to say misplaced anger towards you know his play, but I really. You know, it's a fine line, man, because you gotta you gotta kind of deliver the news, deliver the stats, deliver the box score news. Right. But there was so much happening on and off the court yeah. with him that like it was really hard for us to to buy into like the hate. I, I really do think some fans and it happens to every team, but there's a lot of misguided right. uh 
yeah. hatred that goes towards these players sometimes, man. But yeah, I mean, when the team is as bad as it's been, I mean, it's been right. Pretty, it was pretty good with Marchin, but right. we're talking about Wizards fans here, and and the hatred is so there's so much of it that it easily gets misplaced, and 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 people become scapegoats, and the the cause for blame, and um, you know, and so Marchin unfortunately was was a victim of that towards the end of his career, like you said in D.C. and but you know, like you said, people that followed him closely, that followed him, you know, at practices and at games and in the locker room, on and off the court, you know, kind of see a different version of him. And um, obviously, that hatred doesn't exist uh, on that side. Yeah, and he even let us in on his departure from the team, which sounded like it. Obviously, I, I wouldn't think anything else, but it was right. it was certainly amicable, right? And that, that that's a testament to, I guess, the relationships that he values throughout the right. league, not just in the managerial level, but you know, among other players. So I thought it was good. It was really. Good. <laughs> Mad respect for the front office, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, anybody anybody who hates Ernie is going to be really disappointed in some of his well, answers. But, you know, hey, look, man, there's a lot of stuff that we don't see. There's a lot yeah. of stuff the fans don't see. And to be honest with you when, you, when you look at this thing as a whole, instead of just the, you know, the basketball on the court, right. there's a lot that goes into the things that these guys do. And, you know, I, it's it's good to peel back the onion sometimes and give 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 the fans kind of a, a – voyeuristic look into you know the nba organization what makes it run well the vo- the voyeuristic view ended up being a an old t-rex sitting behind <laughs> the front office desk <laughs> unbelievable and, and, right that i mean that was such it was so descriptive um i mean you know i mean calling a guy uh, you know and, and he meant it in the nicest way possible yes of course he was yeah, just course. old school an old school guy that kind of just sat behind the desk and just you know, kind of outline the way things should happen and, and, and then expected them to happen. Whereas guys like, you know, Tommy, I mean, he, I, I honestly didn't know what to expect out of him in regards to Tommy. Um, but as much as he said, kind of just goes along the line of what we've already learned about Tommy. Um, and, and that he's, he's, a, he's the people's guy. I mean, yeah. Marchin mentioned him whenever good times, bad times. I mean, it was Tommy that was the, the vocalist that would come out and, you know, either, you know, pep the guys up or, um, uh, even yell at him. Like he said, you know, Tommy's such a nice guy that, that Martin genuinely was upset for disappointing him. Um, so it says a lot about Tommy says a lot about Martin. And yet another person who really wanted Tom to get the job. So uh, yeah. I think we yeah. did some more proof that the right decision was definitely made there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's gonna be a tough interview to top, man. I guess yeah. we gotta, we're gonna have to, uh, <laughs> we have to get some uh, quality guests here from the weeks ahead. Uh, good stuff, man. 